consequences of policies that improve opportunities for immigrant youth. And in particular, there may be unintended or well, negative consequences for immigrant girls in cases that there are tensions between the gender norms of the cultures of the host country and of the country of origin. So the particular research question that we are after is to understand what happens to immigrant youth when opportunities, economic opportunities to integrate in the workplace and society are expanded. So these are integration policies. The particularly policy we're looking here at today is endowing immigrants with birthright citizenship, which basically gives immigrants the same opportunities, the same legal rights as the native peers. So if we would think about a neoclassical model, this would predict clearly an increase in welfare and in integration into the mainstream societies. To improve opportunities, immigrants are taking these up, and this, if anything, increases their welfare. But what we have in mind is if we have immigrants coming from a culture where immigrants are caught in between cultures, caught in the sense that the children may want to integrate into the mainstream culture while their parents try to hold them back, they try to retain them in the traditional culture, which is likely to the case for immigrant girls, in particular coming, we're talking here about the case of Germany and mostly about Turkish immigrants, which come from a Muslim background. You can think here about tensions between the norms in German culture as well as in the Turkish culture. This would really could lead to unintended consequences. And the question what we have here is whether such intergenerational identity concerns that the parents basically want the kids to retain their traditional culture while the children want to take up the opportunities. They want to basically integrate in the workplace, want to take up the economic opportunities. Um, and that these tensions may basically lead to a lowering of well-being and prevent assimilation. Maybe just to um, anticipate, if you think about citizenship, this really gives the, the immigrants the chance to take up any type of job. This gives them access to civil servant jobs, which are almost 10% in, in, uh, in Germany. So basically this enlarges their window of economic, of their job opportunities. And also there's a large literature showing that um, citizenship has a positive impact on employment outcomes. So what we are going to do, we will build on the theoretical identity model of Akerlof and Crampton. And basically what they are saying in their seminal paper is that choice of identity may be one of the most important economic decisions people make. And if you limit this choice, which is what we are basically pushing here, if you limit, if parents are limiting the choice of children um, to look whether they want to fo follow the host country identity or their country of origin identity, that could really limit their ind individual's economic, the individual's well-being. So what we really do here is we apply this model by Akalov and Cranton to an intergenerational context. We basically have parents and kids bargaining um, among them. We construct a simple game theoretic model where identity concerned parents proscribe children's choices. So the children we're talking here, we will observe them at age 15. So basically they're still minor, they're still um, cohabiting with their parents and the parents still have a strong influence. But we're going to show them that if you enlarge economic opportunities, by a policy such as birthright citizenship that enhances the aspiration of these immigrant youth, but the parents may sabotage these plans in case these plans contradict their identity concerns, which is the case for immigrant girls. If you think that the parents want them to stay at home and basically take over the role of a housewife and a, and a, and a wife, while the girls may want to take up their opportunities and invest into, into a career. And what we do in the end, we basically discuss the policy dilemma, dilemma inherent in these models, which is basically, yes, we can design policies that incentivize individuals to invest in a host country, um, human capital to take up job opportunities, but at the same time, we may not be able to protect these individuals, in this case, the immigrant girls, from the reaction of, of their parents who oppose those activities. After lining out the theoretical model, we will empirically test the welfare consequences of a well-intentioned policy. So basically, empirically um, test whether a policy such as birthright citizenship, which enhances the economic and political opportunities of the immigrant children, whether this has unintended consequences in terms of their well-being. The empirical design relies on a legal reform of the naturalization law in Germany. So basically, as of January 1st, 2000, any child um, with non-German parents born in Germany 
had the right to German citizenship conditional on their parents living for at least eight years in Germany. And what we see around this time, basically, between the kids born before 2000 and after, we have a jump of 50 percentage points in the probability of immigrant kids, second generation immigrant kids, enjoying citizenship. We collected our own data. Um, we basically went to uh, almost 60 schools um, in Germany and conducted in-class surveys with the universe of kids present in these classes um, in order to collect measures on well-being and other outcomes that are of interest in this, in this context. And then we basically use, we combine the um, identification, this kind of natural experiment with the data and employ a local difference in difference design. So to anticipate the results before going into details of the model and um, the empirical approach, what we do find is that this introduction of birthright citizenship in the year of 2000, 15 years later, um, leads to a lowering of the subjective well-being as well as self-esteem, another measure of well-being for immigrant girls. So that is basically the unintended consequence. And if you then look at um, kind of the different mechanisms that the model lies out, we see basically that immigrant girls raise their aspirations, but at the same time are disillusioned. They basically decrease the expectations to be able to reach their aspirations. They raise their perceived odds of having to forgo a career for family. So basically they raise their, their, their odds of believing that they have to stay home and basically fulfill the traditional gender roles. Astonishingly, we also observed that parents of the kids that enjoy birthright citizenship due to the reform reduce their investments into the immigrant girl's human capital. In terms of they reduce their support provided, provided to the schooling investments, as well as they reduce or they speak more often the language of the country of origin. They speak less the country, uh, the language of the host country. We also observed that um, immigrant girls that enjoy citizenship um, engage less in social activities and they identify less as a German. Important, all these effects are concentrated among immigrant daughters of Muslim families. Um, we do not observe any impact on immigrant daughters in non-Muslim families. And among immigrant sons, if anything, we seem, it, they seem to benefit from the reform. So, so much about um, basically what you're going to see in the upcoming, um, I guess, 40 minutes. Um, what I'm going to do, I will briefly wrap up the literature and then I will kind of lay out the theoretical framework, starting with the neoclassical framework and then going into this framework with identity concerns of the parents. I will provide you with more information about the, the citizenship reform in Germany and then show you the empirical strategy data and results. Just briefly, um, our paper relates to two strands of literature which are concerned with identity. On the one hand, the literature which is concerned with gender identity, with traditional gender norms and stereotypes, as well as immigrant identity. And what we basically have here, we have an intersection of tradi traditional gender norms coming, basically being prevalent for immigrants coming from more traditional countries. So we have here an intersection of gender identity and immigrant identity and what is important is that we do observe, in particular for the country that we look at, oppositional gender norms between the country of origin and the country, um, which is the host country. So basically, immigrants having much stronger traditional gender norms than um, the native population. Our work um, connects to our own prior work on the impact of citizenship, which has found that, yes, indeed, Citizenship raises opportunities and it translates into improved education and social integration. But all our findings has only found positive effect for boys and not for girls. And so far that was a puzzle. We couldn't really explain why we um, didn't find anything for girls. And we do believe that by looking at it, kind of introducing this identity concerns and traditional gender identity um, norms, we can basically contribute to understand why this policy, which is a well-intended policy, um, works only for boys and not for girls. So let me start off with the, with the neoclassical model. So what we do have here, we have immigrant youth at the end of compulsory schooling. So they are right at the onset of making important decisions for the future. And the policy that we have in mind is citizenship it materialized when they are turning 18, when they're leaving school and enter the labor market. So basically at 18, they will be able to vote, eventually um, also 
go up for elections and as well, they basically will enter in the labor market. So the model we look at is these kids have to make a basic decision whether they want at the end of compulsory schooling go for a low effort career or a high effort career. In case they go for a low effort career, they have zero probability of career success. If they go for a high effort career, they have with a positive probability of P, they have um, the probability to basically be successful. So the child chooses between low effort and high effort in order to maximize the expected payoff, which is basically if the child invests into low effort, a low utility level, and if the child invests into high effort with a positive probability P, a high um, utility level, um, and of course the child has to invest and pays a certain cost. So in the end, depending on the cost level that the child has to pay if investing into a high effort career. The child goes for a low effort career if basically the individual costs are too high. And if they are above a critical cost level, the child goes for a high effort career if the individual costs are below um, a critical cost level. And this critical cost level depends basically on this utility the difference between what you get out of from a high, um, of from a high effort career and from a low effort career. And the probability of really then ending up in a high utility, um, in a high utility job. So what does this policy do if you increase the opportunities? It basically increases here the probability of ending up in a high utility job. So if you look at the comparative statics in such a neoclassical model, what birthright citizenship does, it increases the probability to get to be successful. And it also increases then the critical cost level under which it pays off to invest in a high effort career. A question here about if you're a, a, a citizen in Germany as compared to someone who simply has permanent residence, what, what actually are the advantages? You mentioned being able to vote, but your labor market opportunities are the same, are they? Are your welfare benefit eligibility the same? Yes, so everything basically, um, I think this is an important point. So we're, not, we're talking about legal immigrants. They have a permanent residence. Um, there are, I think, the, the real restrictions, the welfare benefits, everything is the same. The real restrictions is that you don't have access to civil servant jobs. You do not have the right to leave the country for more than four years. So basically, if you are citizenship, you have access to the whole European labor market. You're much more free. As a permanent resident, you can only leave the country for up to a year and afterwards you would lose your citizenship. Does this answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. So basically, if we look at a neoclassical model, if anything, such an um, opportunity enhancing um, policy would raise the probability to be successful. And for a kid who had already before the reform, an incentive to invest in a high effort career would, if anything, experience a utility gain because now the probability of being successful rises. A child with effort costs, which were below before the reform too high to invest now would switch from a low effort to a high effort career and would also experience a utility gain. While a child with high effort costs, which are too high even after this improvement in opportunities would maintain a low effort and the utility would be unaffected. So in that scenario, if anything, birthright citizenship, which enhances opportunity, should increase child's well-being. Given your model, um, and given that this is a lot about careers, are you going to look at um, educational investments? Are you going to look at crime as an outcome? We are not. So we are basically here interested in the end in the well-being. We will have a measure of life satisfaction. In previous work, we have looked at whether birthright citizenship increased educational outcomes, educational achievement. It did for boys, it did not for girls. What we look here right now is really the reduced form effect of improving opportunities from the onset of birth and how this affects well-being at the age of 15. And then afterwards, we look at different outcomes that may explain whether parents play a role and impose their identity concerns and um, decisions on the kids. So should I think about education and maybe crime and maybe careers as a mechanism for this impact on identity? Or do you think these are like distinct things? With identity, we're talking here about the parents' identity and whether the parents' identity concerns will impact um, their children's well-being or choices and well-being in the end. So I do think um, 
I can't really distinguish from what all enters there. So it's really a reduced form effect. At birth, they are experiencing a shock, a shock which influences the long run opportunities. And we will look at how do these kids fare um, at age 15. Let's reconsider this and really take these identity concerns of the parents um, into consideration. So we think here of parents and children are interacting, they're bargaining, and in fact, the parents are dictators and have the last say in children's career choices. So that's a strong assumption, but remember these kids are 15, um, they, they are coming from cultures where the parents really have the say in a particular, if you think about immigrant girls. There may be a frictions between the identity current concerns of the parents and children's career choices in a Western um, host country. So the traditional parents may prefer their child, and in particular the girl, to pursue a low success career. And if the kid doesn't follow that preference of the parents and goes for a high success career and realizes basically um, career success, the parents might experience a loss, um, might experience an identity externality, it might experience a loss of um, identity. If the parents forces the kid in order forces the kid to follow low, um, a low effort career and basically the kid has to give up the high effort career the child feels regret and this regret is an increasing function of foregone career opportunities. So what I want to do is basically I want to look at this um, game tree which basically kind of provides an intuition of what's happening between the child and the parent. So you basically see here the child, the child can propose a low effort career if the individual costs are too high to invest in a high effort career. If the costs are low enough, it proposes a high effort career. Let's, uh, for the moment, think about traditional parents having traditional gender norms and basically prescribing or would have an identity loss in, ki in case the kid goes for a high effort career. So if the child proposes a high effort career, and the parents would accept the high effort career, the traditional parent, the parent would here experience an identity externality in depending on how strong they feel about their own identity, they may go into some argument with the kid and basically compare what is stronger, their own identity externality um, or the conflict they are they are having with the kid in order to force the child to go for a low effort career. So in case the identity concerns are strong enough, the, the parents might force the children into a low effort career and that in turn might induce the kids to anticipate their loss in utility by having the conflict and also the regret of not being able to pursue the high effort career and they may from the beginning basically propose a low effort career anticipating the, that the parents would force them anyway into a low effort career. So in the end they go for a low effort career and if they are low cost kids basically for whom it would pay out to invest into a high effort career, they feel regret. There's a question guy or? Yeah, could I ask a question about yes. this? I, mean, I, I understand the mechanism, I, I, you know, it seems seems kind of, kind of reasonable and, and, and but I'm kind of, I, I'm kind of think there might be some nuances here that, that might not be fully captured. So, um, I mean, to some extent, this is kind of assuming something quite harsh about the parents, right? Something that the parents really, what the parents want is like to kind of, you know, you know, diminish their daughter's career. And that's quite a strong assumption. Now, maybe what the parents want is something that is correlated. Maybe the parents want lots of grandkids. Maybe the parents want like, a, you know, that the that the daughter and the grandkids would have like their retain their values. And I could see why like in a reduced form, what you're doing is kind of capturing some of that, but it seems to me like it might be kind of pushing it a bit too far. I don't know if the parents, you know, if the parents were able to say, well, if my daughter would be, you know, super successful and the kids would, you know, have lots of kids and would retain these values, then, you know, why would, you know, wouldn't I be even happier? So I think what we should think of, I totally agree. I think it's a, it's a very harsh uh, model. Um, I think what we, what we have in mind here is really parents decide, kind of do not want their kids to be unhappy, but they have basically the strong assumption you can only be happy if you live according to the identity concerns of the traditional um, culture basically they are having. So I think you should think of imperfect altruism here. 
I don't think that this model is the only, of course, only model that might, might apply to the case of immigrant um, families. At the end of the talk, I will come up with alternative explanations for what we're seeing. We do, in fact, see that this, um, this policy reduced the well-being of the immigrant girls. And I will, at the end, uh, be happy to discuss this. I'm, I'm not sure if I fully uh, answered your, your question right now, but maybe I can, uh, I can postpone alternative models to the end of the talk. Christina, if I could just quickly follow up on Guy's question, maybe you could think of a more nuanced situation in which the parents of the children have different career goals. Maybe the parents have in mind a sort of intermediate career goals, doesn't have to be closed at home. So for the kind of intermediate career goal, there is a sort of fixed amount of career success that you expect. And within that fixed amount, the citizenship right and the parental effort are substitute. So once you get the citizenship right, you can save on your effort to achieve that kind of intermediate goal. It doesn't have to be locking the, the, the daughter at home. This would have to be true for both, right? For boys and girls. Well, you may have different, different career goals for boys and girls. I mean, this is part of the norms, but it doesn't have to be that the, that the daughters have to be locked at home for, for having that kind of result. No, I, I don't. I think I express myself extremely um, extreme. So I think you could think of a low effort career and a high effort career. It doesn't really have to yeah. be locked in. Yeah. So yeah, but also, I mean, the, 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 the parents are happier with a certain amount of career. It's simply that within that amount, citizenship right and effort are substitutable. So you can save on one if you get the other. Let me, let me, post, let me think about sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I might, if I see afterwards all the results of the mechanism, um, it comes to my mind what kind of result would um, contradict that as the sole explanation. I don't think we can exclude alternative explanations fully, but I think there is a, a full set of explanation which basically supports the story that, that we, are, we are telling. So the subgame equilibrium of the model that we have in mind is basically depending on the intensity, intensity of the identity concerns of the parents. And if the parents have low identity concerns, basically the outcomes are in the neo, as in the neoclassical model. If the child has extremely high cost of investing in a high effort career, it will invest only in a low effort career and the parents accept it. If the child has low cost to invest in a high effort career, it will propose high effort and the parents accept it. However, ever, if the parents have very strong identity concerns, the child will basically propose low effort from the beginning, knowing that the parents would basically enforce this choice anyway. So basically for a child with low effort, with low cost of investing, this would basically lead to an outcome which is under, under ambitious due to the identity concerns of the parents. And in this case, the child feels regret. So let me try to lay out what are the comparative statics of a policy that improves opportunities, such as the birthright citizenship. What you see on the Vertical axis are the costs of the children. So down here are the low cost children. Those are the ones, ones for whom it pays off to invest in a high effort career already before the opportunity enhancing reform. Here in between C minus had and C plus had other the kids for those. Um, it is paying off basically once the reform kicks in. And above here are the kids who, for whom the, kid, the costs are too high and they will never invest in a high effort career. Here we have basically on the vertical axis, we have the identity concerns and here we have the parents that have very low identity concerns and they let basically the kids decide um, on their own. So here, those are basically the impact, the comparative statics for the opportunity enhancing reform for those that have very low costs of investing they will basically continue investing into a high effort career and experience a utility gain. Here are the ones that switch from a low effort to a high effort career due to the improved opportunities of the, of the reform and they also experience a utility gain. So here we basically have, as in a neoclassical model, an increase, if anything, in the utility due to the reform. Here we have the case between lambda plus and lambda minus, we have basically parents with moderate identity concerns. They did not feel basically threatened by, um, by the kids going for a high effort career before um, the opportunity enhancing reform because the, the odds of the probability of basically being successful um, in, 
in a, in a career were too low after the reform, the odds increased. So basically here, the parents forced the kids to invest in a low effort career. And here we have basically neo-traditional parents. The kids that were before able to invest now are forced in order to go for a low effort career, they experience a utility loss. And the same here for the kids, they experience basically utility loss due to the regret. Now they would like to invest um, because it would pay off, but they cannot. And here it's the case for the families where the parents have very high identity concerns that already kicked in before the reform. And here we basically have a utility loss due to the increased regret, the regret increasing in opportunity, um, economic opportunities. So what we are going to do, we're basically going to apply now, we look at empirically at the impact on well-being um, of a reform that increased opportunity. And we will distinguish between, well, with the poor measure that we have, um, parents with weak identity concerns in the sense of having opposing identity, opposing gender identity between the host country and the country of origin, and the ones with strong. So what we will do here is basically looking at non-Muslim immigrants and Muslim immigrants being the only type of pre-reform, which means pre-birth, measure of identity concerns. So to give you the institutional background, we look here at the reform of the German naturalization law, which took place in 1999, and which basically led to a switch from a youth sanguini system to a youth soli system. So all kids, all second generation immigrant children born before 2000 um, could only receive citizenship if their parents were naturalized. So this actually was the case for less than a third of all second generation immigrant children. It's so low because their double citizenship in this case was not allowed. So basically the costs for the parents were pretty high. For all kids born after January 1st, 2000, they acquired citizenship automatically with the parents having no right to disclaim it by being born on German territory. The condition was an eight year residency in Germany of at least one parent. So to give you some statistics, if you look at the micro census, as I said, almost a third of the second generation immigrant kids born before the reform had German citizenship due to their parents naturalizing. Afterwards, among all second generation immigrant children, 80% were entitled due to at least one of their parents having resided at least eight years in Germany. That numbers are reflected in our own survey, which are self-reported um, statements of whether the kids have German citizenship and whether they have this already from birth onwards. So what we're going to do, we will exploit this reform. We will compare second generation immigrant children born before and after the cutoff. We look at children born within a plus or minus six months window around the cutoff. What is nice is basically that the school cohort cutoff is June 30th. So the kids born in this plus or minus six month, month window around the citizenship reform all belong to the same school cohort. And then we will draw upon native children to isolate possible age and seasonal effects and we estimate this local difference and difference model where we estimate here our outcome well-being on a migrant dummy, on a dummy being born after the cutoff and then the interaction between the two. These are high restrictions. We basically are kind of high demands on data. We basically need kids born in a plus minus six month window around 2000 and we need um, also information on soft outcomes such as well-being. So we conducted our own data collection in almost 60 schools in eight cities in two states of Germany in the year 2015, when these kids were roughly 15 years old. And we targeted the universe of all ninth and 10th grader. So depending, um, basically this was the final year of compulsory schooling, they differ between the two states here. So these were all kids just before basically finishing compulsory schooling. And those kids are mainly born in the window that is of interest. Altogether, we had 4,000 kids, 50% natives, 30% where both parents had an immigrant background. And if we restrict the sample to kids born in the plus or minus six month window, we have almost 1,600, 600 immigrant kids, which are the treated group and 1,500 native kids. The measures of interest is a life satisfaction measure that's uh, measured on a Likert scale from zero to 10. We will afterwards 
where it's standardized it to a mean zero and a standard deviation one for the native kids. We use an alternative measure which um, takes self-esteem. These are five different components and will again um, standardize them to a mean zero and uh, standard deviation of one of the natives. And then we will exploit a large array of additional outcomes which allow us to look a little bit whether what our model predicts that we have, if we have increased opportunities, increased aspirations and expectations, that the parents, in case they have traditional identity concerns, may reduce their investments. We will then look at social integration outcomes as well as identity and assimilation beliefs for their, for their immigrant youth. Just one uh, clarification question. By getting citizenship, would uh, immigrants uh, or immigrant children lose access to any other uh, benefits that might be reserved to non-citizens, for example, any kind of you know support or uh, kind of coaching or anything like that, oh. or is it just the same? No, it's uh, it's the same. Basically, we're talking here about a comparison between permanent citizen and uh, sorry, permanent residents and citizen. So any kind of welfare benefits, access to as you are having in mind. Um, tutoring programs that are the same. It's really about having this long-term horizon. You can stay in the country, you have the same rights in terms of political and economic opportunities as a native. So just uh, in the interest of time, I'm stripping this, the, the statistics. What you can see here for the girls, as well as for the boys, they are largely balanced in terms of the kids born before and after the policy in terms of baseline family characteristics, education and mothers mothers and fathers education and age and in terms of regional characteristics. So what I'm showing you here is basically the essence of the paper. So you see here in red the life satisfaction where you have basically zero is the mean of the native youth um, life satisfaction for immigrant girls born before the reform and after and here in blue for the native girls born before and after. And I think the main takeaways here are as follows. First of all, for the girls, the immigrant girls born before the reform, they are happier than native girls. There's no difference between native girls born before and after, as to be expected. There's nothing happening around this cutoff for natives. And we do see a substantial drop in life satisfaction um, for, the, for the immigrant girls born after the, the cutoff. So basically for uh, the girls that have the right to citizenship conditional on them being basically born in Germany and their parents having resided for at least eight years in Germany. That result holds true even if you restrict the sample to a window of plus minus month around, around the cutoff. So that is basically the main takeaway. We have a substantial drop in life satisfaction for immigrant girls if they're born into a regime of use solely instead of use sanguini, if we look at boys, we don't see anything going on. Basically, they are equally well off no matter if born under one regime or the other. If we basically, if I show you here the results for, uh, from the, for the difference and difference uh, model, we basically see exactly the, the same result. For the girls being born after the reform, for the immigrant girls being born after the reform, we have a substantial reduction in life satisfaction by 0.3 standard deviations, given that basically this um, compliance, the increase in citizenship was by 50 percentage points, we would have to scale it up by two. So it's a reduction by 0.6 standard deviation, which corresponds more or less to a reduction in life satisfaction of 16%. So that's basically for the girls, for the boys, there's nothing. Well, if anything, an increase, however, it's not statistically significant. Isn't it interesting I, that the, the baseline happiness of the immigrant girls is actually higher than the native? It is, it is higher, yes. So pre-reform, well, altogether immigrant girls are happier. I do think what is important is these are self-reported measures. Um, they're not anchored. So what is important to us is basically this drop before after. It is a statement um, coming if you look at well-being measures that um, different cultures have, have different levels of, uh, of happiness. Um, I think this comes from that, but it really what is important to us is this drop, not basically we compare that drop to that change. So basically that is our first main result, the significant drop in well-being of immigrant girls 
If we, we do a couple of robustness checks, we reduce the sample window down to two months. We do an RDD um, estimation. We do different types where we have a donut uh, approach where we um, cluster the standard errors. It's basically robust throughout all um, a robustness check. What we do next is we basically split our sample according to more traditional and less traditional immigrant um, groups. This distinction is, as I said, given that we really have no better way of distinguishing between more and less traditional groups, given that we need it before the reform. So if you see here, that's the World Economic Forum Gender Gap Index. In Germany, basically, on average, women have 75% of the opportunities in terms of economic, political, educational, and health opportunities than, than men. In the countries of origin from the non-Muslim uh, migrants, that corresponds to two-thirds. Two For the Muslim immigrants in their country of origin, it's basically 59%. So you see here, basically, a pretty strong difference in terms of how, um, how much is gender equal, equality going on in the countries of, of origin. So if we split the sample, this is now only for, basically here it's for girls, by Muslim girls and non-Muslim girls, you see that the results that we have seen so far are fully driven by the, by the Muslim girls. They experience a sharp decline in their life satisfaction if being born after the reform. For the non-Muslim non girls, nothing significant shows up for the boys as well as well not. So this is basically the key result. What we do see here that an opportunity enhancing reform at birth has a direct impact on life satisfaction of a reduction for Muslim girls of 0 0.5 standard deviation. And the question is now, is this basic, can this be explained by the model that we've laid out, laid out before, and can this be explained by identity concerns of the parents? So in the first instance, I will show you basically the results for immigrant girls' aspiration and expectations, whether they're disillusioned, and what are their odds of having to forgo a career for family. Then I will look at parental investments and then at social integration identity and beliefs. So basically to show you that this would if we find here supportive evidence, would all support our story. And in the next, uh, on the next slide, I will basically look at alternative explanations and whether they are also in line with the full set of results. So I do think it's always important to have in mind the full set of results. So regarding aspirations, I'm, in the interest of time, I'm only showing you basically the, the direction of the effect and all errors that I'm showing you are basically um, reflecting significant changes. So we do see that having birth, enjoying birthright citizenship increases the probability of experiencing disillusionment, to have higher aspirations and at the same time reduced expectations for Muslim girls, nothing for non-Muslim girls. They also increase their odds of having to forgo a career for family if being born um, with citizenship among the non-Muslim girls this reduces. So that basically goes in line. We have an increase, increasing in aspirations, but a reduction in expectations and a fulfilling a kind of prophecy you go with the traditional um, identity concerns. Astonishingly, the parents, if their kids are born under a birthright citizenship regime, they reduce their schooling support. So that would go in line with the argument that Barbara had brought before, maybe they're substitutes. But they also are more likely to never speak German at home. Not sure if this could um, also go in line with, um, um, with never speaking German at home. Maybe you want to enforce the country of origin culture. Um, but still, the girls are more basically disillusioned and they basically increase their beliefs about having to forgo a career for family. If it comes to social integration, we see here we have an index um, that runs from zero, that's wrong zero to four, and measuring whether they have to, whether they are participating in social clubs, such as the music club, the sports club, the newspaper and theater club, that goes down basically by altogether one activity less um, for the girls being born after the reform. The, an index, which is also a, a standardized index, whether they report to feel being supported by their friends goes down. Their self-reported 
identification with do you feel that you, do you identify, identify yourself with being German goes down and also their beliefs about whether a foreigner can have a good life in Germany goes down. So basically you see here all these results going in line with an opportunity enhancing reform increases aspirations, reduces then their expectations, the parents decreasing their support for assimilation and success in the host country and the girls basically um, not as socially assimilating into the host country. So there may be, of course, alternative stories and I don't want to rule them out. However, this entire set of results, if you think of what are other models, I think the first might be unmet expectations. So basically, the Muslim immigrant girls thought citizenship would open doors for them, but they are disappointed when they learn that it's not the case. It might be that they're still discriminated. I do think that result is not easily reconcilable with the drop in parental investment. So they should not, we should not observe that as well as not this odds of having to forego a career for family. We also have additional evidence on beliefs, what it takes to succeed in Germany. Basically, we do not see any effect on that immigrant girls believe that you need to be German in order to succeed or that you need to do extra effort here um, when you are uh, an immigrant. An alternative uh, explanation could be resource shifting, basically immigrant families shifting resources from the girls to the boys, um, basically thinking that here it would, uh, would pay off more if they invest more in the boys succeeding. What we do, we do basically a separate analysis for immigrant girls that have older boys that did not have access to birthright citizenship because they were born before the reform. And basically we observe that that drop in well-being exists for both immigrant girls with brothers that have citizenship and the ones that have not. And finally, basically we have an extra piece of evidence. We see a reduction in life satisfaction right now. But if you look at kind of expected life satisfaction from now in five years on, we see an increase in their hopes, basically that life will become better, which is a little bit in line. Once I leave home, I basically can improve my, my life. So to wrap up here, what we do see here is that a, a, a opportunity enhancing reforms such as citizenship, which has been argued to be an effective policy for social inclusion and has been actually shown that it does improve educational outcomes and social integration for immigrant boys, may not have the intended consequences for girls and actually have unintended consequences and may basically affect their well-being and basically lead to a conflict um, between the parents and the girl and even hamper social integration. We do think that the entirety of our results provide empirical evidence for a model where the parents have strong identity concerns for the daughters, but not for the sons. And this, in the end, really points to a fundamental policy dilemma if we think of there is a well-intentioned policy, which in the end may cause um, unintended consequences for the parent, for the kids, because they cannot be protected against um, concerns from others. Well, I don't want to leave you basically with this very negative um, outlook. We do think there is, we don't know what is going to happen in the years thereafter. If we look at this expected life satisfaction five years later, we do so we increase in expected life satisfaction um, thereafter, which is consistent with the idea that Muslim immigrant girls granted citizenship have large conflicts with their parents, but are still optimistic that at some point these constraints will lessen. So sorry for rushing. Um, I'm happy to discuss now or later in a break. Time for like a brief question, kind of just Brief one, somebody. Could, could I just ask a, a, a quick question? If you, I mean, you just really have one cohort of, you know, school-aged children, and sometimes your age within a cohort has all sorts of effects, and it might be a different effects for different groups. If you just look at aggregate performance of migrant children in education, um, you know, do you see these drops that your, your, your model is, is, is predicting? Do you see the deterioration in the performance of Muslim girls within uh, the education system re relative to Muslim boys in aggregate data? We do see using administrative data an improvement of the immigrant boys 
um, both uh, Muslim and non-Muslim, we don't see any effect, no improvement for immigrant girls. So basically, immigrant boys improve, immigrant girls stay constant, um, but basically immigrant girls from already before have much higher performance, education performance than, than the boys. Well, isn't that a bit of a problem? Because, you know, I mean, why if this model is right, are the immigrant girls doing so much better in education in the, in the first place? Well, I do think there is a, is a different story, right? Um, immigrant girls investing a priori more than, well, girls than boys, do these do this, do serve the same in terms of, in terms of uh, natives, this kind of gender differences. What we are really stressing is the, the changes around the, the cutoff if you're enhanced with, with, um, uh, with uh, citizenship. What we do observe is that the citizenship increases aspiration even for the immigrant girls, which also could enhance basically their, their efforts, but in the end, the parents sabotage it. So I'm not sure if in the end, having these kind of counterbalancing effects, we, in the end, in performance, we see a zero, a zero uh, result. Christina, this is fascinating. I think we're gonna have to leave this there at, like for, for time constraint. Thank you. Thank you.